Okay, hey everybody, uh, this is maybe a little different, so just bear with me. Uh, title, I'm not gonna go through it, I like alliteration, okay? So what are you gonna do? But the bottom line is the housing recovery, this time it's for real, that's actually, I started saying that last year, uh, but back to normal, still a few years, years away. I'm gonna do an executive summary first and then throw you through a lot of slides, but the, the bottom line is first, there were speculative excesses, crazy lending, and then a huge recession. What did that tell you? There was gonna be a long, extended period of low housing production. Not, a, not, not just really low for a short period, a long time. When you have excesses for a long time, well, it's been a long time. And what are we seeing? The economic recovery, sure, it's not what we'd like to see, but it's been going on for a while. Second, it actually looks like household growth is now recovering. Although, which I'll go through in a little bit, one of the problems is government data on this, I, I'm just gonna say it the way you would say it, it sucks, it's unreliable. But right now, that's what it says. Third, the inventory decline in terms of the number of homes actually for sale, it's been astonishing, just absolutely astonishing. Um, and one of the other things, and this is what, I'm gonna show you some data on this, the conversion of single family homes to rentals, I'm talking a single family detached home. Single family detached home rental market is the fastest growing by far rental market in the United States. The others aren't even close. Home prices are now back in line with rents and income. For, so people were saying, oh, it looks like it's still going down because they're still that, that's just bull. Um, and they're actually stabilizing or improving. And so the forecast that I put out at the latter part of last year that home prices will be up this year, which actually pissed off some of my clients, is going, uh, looking about right. So I think we're gonna get a slow, steady housing recovery, but we still do have some inventory numbers, we still have some under, so it's got the normal still a few years away. Now, some of you may have seen me at past National Association of Home Builders forecast, uh, and I actually, using loan level data, loan level data, I started talking about excessive investors, uh, high leverage lending, whatever, back in 2005. And 2000, in 2006, I got a little more intense. 2007, I started to get really intense. I'm not gonna go through every one, but I mean, I'm, I'm, this is, again, based on loan level data that was available and ignored. You can see, I mean, in 2006, I finally said you had to be on something not to see bubbles in some areas. <laughs> You're wondering who that is, that's me. That is a picture <laughs> of me. In the late 70s, I was on something. I missed the bubble in the 70s. <laughs> I've been clean for two decades. I didn't miss this one. <clears throat> so, but what were the signs? We all know the home prices went crazy relative to incomes or whatever in rents. But investor second home purchases, junk, low to no doc lending, spikes, subprime starts. I mean, it was all there. Nobody looked at it. I think we all remember the tape of a, a, a no-doc lender when he was asked, what did you really know about the finances of the person you borrowed to, you lent money to? I know nothing, nothing. And yes, that said it all, okay? <laughs> we know, okay, home prices went crazy to the upside. But if you now know, they're back in line. This is actually from my friend at Calculated Risk blog. Uh, you know, I could have done you know, a ton of them. Uh, there is one thing, there's a boatload of home price indexes, but I won't go into that because I can speak for hours on the differences. Um, but also, when you looked at the available data, non-owner-occupied purchase loan origination just went nuts in the middle of the decade. Absolutely nuts. And the evidence was there. Builders were presented. And what was their song? What was their song? I want to rock! There we go. <laughs> Sorry. All right? And so you can see housing start. Even, you know, in 2005, they heard all this. They went up. 2006, things are getting bad. They kept it up, which, you know, that, and, and it, you know, it was just absolutely nuts. Finally, we all know what happened. We knew that at the same time they were keeping um, housing production up, up, household growth had dramatically slowed. That uh, line there is single family, multifamily and manufacturer housing completions. The black line is household growth over five years, which dramatically slowed. You can see household production coming online exceeded household growth. Inventories went nuts, and all of a sudden, builders started singing a different song. That 
That, of course, is poised in 1990, but that's a different story. <laughs> but you saw it now. The existing home inventories, when investors were buying like crazy, the inventories didn't go up because they successfully flipped, successfully flipped. The latter part of 2005-06, inventory spiked up like I, I wish I still could. I mean, it was just unbelievable. <laughs> unbelievable, and stayed up there. And yet people said, soft landing. Hello. But the good news, the good news, this goes back to my executive site, inventories are now down 40% for the peak. And from in terms of a month supply perspective, they're pretty much all the way back to normal. A little bit high, but almost back to normal. You know, you, this, these are just examples of some areas with huge investor shares. You know, Orlando, the home listings went from 3,000 to 26,000 in a year. Phoenix, from about 10,000 to 55,000. Soft landing. Hello. And new single family completed homes for sale. This is from census. You know, we know that completed vacant homes went up a lot. Uh, but and in fact, if you look at certain Census Bureau data, they were actually up a lot more than what the new single family home report from Census suggested because sales cancellations were up dramatically and they don't cover it right. So, I mean, Jiminy Cricket. And we all know what happened to the seriously delinquent loans and the foreclosure. Now, that has actually improved dramatically, but it's still high and it's still disconcerting. And there are still issues about how a lot of those are going to be resolved. And quite frankly, anybody who says they know is lying because nobody knows. But it, it's come down dramatically. Now, one of the incredible things, though, is that as there have been a lot of foreclosures and short sales, there has been a quantum shift, quantum shift in the share of the single family detached housing market that is occupied by renters. <clears throat> Both in 2000 and 2006, the, the share of the single family detached housing market that is occupied, that was occupied by renters was about 13%. By 2011, it's 15.7 and available data suggests, although we don't have hard data yet, that it's going to be over 16%. That, that it stated another way, we all know that the number of renters has gone up a lot relative to the number of homeowners. You know, home ownership rate went down, duh. Almost half of the increase in the number of renters are living in single family detached homes. So when people say there's this big old shadow inventory because a lot of people are in a home but they're having trouble and they might have to do a short term foreclosure, it, some, it appears, as far as I can tell, two thirds of them end up renting another single family detached home. So when you, someone says the shadow inventory, oh my gosh, it's all this stuff comes on the market, it gets absorbed. And it's being absorbed at a pace that's, for whatever reason, hardly anybody writes about. Uh, I do. So one of the problems, though, is that the macro housing analysis is hampered by good, timely housing data. When we got census, decennial census 2010 data, we found that there were significant issues, accuracy issues, with other data, for example, the housing vacancy survey on the housing stock, on households, on headship rates, both by total and age cohort, home ownership rates appeared to be off, vacancy rates, total and region off, and the amount of the housing stock that appears to be lost every year, that was off. Every frigging variable that you use for a macro housing analysis was off in the earlier survey. I mean, that is unambiguously, oh, never mind. Well, never mind. All right, we missed a sound clip. Big deal. And just to give you an example, I'm not going to go through each summary, but if you looked at the housing vacancy survey, that's, you know, every quarter you hear the home ownership rate was blockety blood, it's timely, you know, whatever. It said that from the first half of 2000 to the first half of 2010, the home ownership rate in the U.S. was virtually unchanged. When we got decennial census, it was like, oh, no, I'm sorry. It was down to 65.4, not 67. Doesn't sound like a, that's 1.6% <laughs> on a base of 75 million. Rental vacancy rate off, homeowner vacancy rate off, gross vacancy rate off. And you know, some of these data issues have been around for a long time. And I've been sparring with the Census Bureau now for a decade on this, but this time around, there's been so much, so many housing analysts have been crying out that this time around they're actually studying why there are differences. And they've actually put out preliminary results, but they're, they're a long way from going. And actually, they reacted, because this is actually 
a tape of an economist calling up census about what they were saying about the state of the quality of housing statistics. Yes. He was obviously pissed. Okay? Yeah, but even though, even though they are studying the differences, and it, right now it looks like that, uh, the housing vacancy survey that so many people rely on on quarterly data is just bogus. Uh, the stuff, they haven't come to conclusions. So the data that we're still getting for 2011 and even 2012, well, that, for example, the American Community Survey, which just, the 2011 data just came out last week, suggests that in 2011, household growth remained very slow. The housing vacancy survey suggests, first off, it's the levels are way off. You know, you can see census, almost 117 million. Housing vacancy survey, 113. American community survey, 115. Another CPS survey, completely different. Uh, I could go into it, but I won't. But these are all different data series. Almost 119 million. But one of them, two of them say slow growth in 2011. One says a little bit of a pickup in 2012. But another one over there that is, uh, actually assumes the population counts are right, my gosh, that looks like it's back to a million a month. In other words, if you, depending on which data series you use, you can tell whatever story you want. Any way you want it, it's the way you need it, any way you want it. I, I think we just had a journey moment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I really do. <laughs> so. Bottom line is, you know, as I said in the executive summary, it does, we have had housing production now so low with household growth coming up that a lot of that excess inventory is being sopped up. It's not complete though. We also know that there's still a lot of troubled loans, either serious of drink or in foreclosure, that we don't know how it's gonna be resolved, but likely the resolution is gonna convert even more people into renters, at least for a while. We know the mortgage underwriting is still a threat. So to in sum, what does that mean my forecast is? And this is just some of the bull bear arguments, but you've heard them all, so I'm just not gonna go through it. It's, a, it's, it's too busy a damn slide anyway. So the net of it is, first off, when I, when I did my forecast, and you can actually find my forecast in January on the web, uh, calculated risk, I did it. You know, I, I had said that Housing starts would be about 740. You can see the lines up there. You can see what the year to date has been. And you can see why it feels like a good year to me. Because I haven't had to change my forecast. Because it's spun out. And at the beginning of the year, and you can get this from uh, the Zillow um, uh, home price expectation survey, I was expecting home prices to be up year over year this year, it, as measured by S&P case Schiller. And in fact, now virtually the vast bulk of people do. So the bottom line is I really am, whoop, my fault. My fault. That is how I reacted because when I turned from a bear to a bull the latter part of last year, I had a lot of people pissed off at me. So the bottom line is what you got to say, let's do it again. Oh, my God. This is how I respond. All right. So the net of it is, this is what I believe will be the pace of housing uh, going forward. I do believe, like when I first put this out at the beginning of last year, this was like, my God, you're too bullish. What we're, this is now getting close to consensus, but I really don't think it's going to be till 2015 or beyond that you're going to see housing production back to what you would normally expect based on demographics. And I know I'm, that's all I'm supposed to speak, so thank you very much. Yeah, go on up, James. Now, that was probably a first, an economist who made me laugh. So. <laughs> Okay, let's see if we can get the uh, slides up now. You want to advance? Yeah, trying to uh, 
to just kind of get the slides up back there. I think what'll be fun here is going through uh, some of the points of difference and uh, the slides as we look at it. But one of the questions I had was, you know, how in the world do I follow an economist like that? Now, I'm not sure I've got the remote working here, guys. Is there, is there a remote plugged in? That's what you were using? Yeah. yeah. Okay. There we go. I think we got this working now. Um, one of the questions I had is, uh, after this, you know, how do I follow a guy like Tom? Well, we, <laughs> we could top it by looking at covariance of some of these things, but in reality, <laughs> I'm a consumer guy. Um, so when we pull up the stretch, pull up the research and predictive analytics uh, work that we do, the question I want to pose, lay out is, what are we seeing for 2013 and beyond from the consumer perspective? And so I'm going to start off with a couple key themes, then a couple key questions that we want to look at. The key themes that we want to look at today are that the demographics that drove decades of growth have disappeared on us. They've shifted very dramatically. What that means is many of the profit pools of the past that we've been mining simply aren't going to rebound. So when we talk about getting back to normal, we might not be getting back to the normal that we used to know, given some, what's happened with some of these shifts. But it doesn't mean profit pools have disappeared. What happened is this decade has ushered in a very different set of profit pools. So those are some of the key themes in some of the data that we're going to see here. Some of it not so good news, some of it creating some pretty interesting opportunities. Now the questions we want to look at today are, first, what's really holding back household formation? Um, what's around the corner for home inventory? What's going to continue to struggle? And is there any growth anywhere? So hopefully we'll give little tidbits of that and can prompt a good discussion afterwards and stuff for you to noodle on as you think about how do some of these things play into the plans as you look plan for 2013 and try to figure out what comes after that as you think about your strategic bets and capital bets that you have to make. So first, this question about what's really holding back household formation. We spend a lot of time on this issue for multifamily developers, because you know, what they're trying to figure out is, you know, is demand growth going to outpace the ridiculous level of supply growth that's coming online? As we've done in some of our analysis, we found that uh, um, supply, you know, su supply, or basically demand, the demand growth, the underlying demand growth picture looks pretty positive for multifamily. Uh, the problem is that uh, supply does not correlate with the underlying demand factors as much as it correlates with availability of, of capital. And so there are some markets where we're looking at where there's a lot more supply of that product coming online. They're trying to figure out, um, can the demand factors even catch up? So as you look about what's holding up this household formation at that level, um, one question is, as we look at the US consumer debt uh, profile, um, this has been the stunner of the last decade. Student loans, that's a five-fold increase over the past decade. Um, obviously, where that really hits hard is young adults. Um, and this is often attributed uh, to you know, one of the big issues that's holding up and keeping people from you know, establishing residences, getting homes. And we took a look at this issue. We actually don't think that's going to be that as big of an issue as we thought. First off, that number is larger because we've got you know, about 40% more students going to college than we did before. So that, the tri that, that takes care of part of that number, um, why student loan debt is higher. And then we took a look at this further. Um, the majority of adults under 30 do not carry a student loan balance. Um, it, the issue was concentrated in the hands of a certain number, but there's still a large population out there for whom that is not an issue. And for those who do carry a student loan balance, on average, it's pretty manageable. Um, you know, the the uh, income debt ratio is still manageable. They're still on track. The student loans did not wipe them out and take away their, their ability to uh, buy a home um, or anything like that. So, we're not so concerned about this issue as to what's holding back household formation, despite what we're reading in the press. Um, the core issue holding back household formation that we worry about is that for college grads under the age of 30, there are 10% fewer of them in the labor force than before, even though it's a larger population. So that's the, that's, that's the bigger challenge here that we're looking at. Another way to look at this picture as we take a look at household formation, we try to take a look at who's forming households. And this has been one of the most telling graphs for us. As we take a look at uh, um, you know, people living at home, which is the, the blue, and then the unemployment rate of young adult males. We find that it's uh, starting to track a lot closer over time. And what we've come to learn working for our multifamily clients, it's tracking 
young male, and, and by the way, this correlates way more with young males than it does with young females. But when young males, when employment rate of young males starts to improve, household formations start to improve. So that's one of the things that we've been looking at pretty closely is we've seen different markets that shifted. It, it, it's, it's tracking very, very tightly as you think about market by market, which ones are you, are you gonna all of a sudden see a lot more people going out, renting apartments and so forth. Okay, so we just a little bit tidbit on household formation. Now we're gonna do a little snapshot on home inventory. Tom touched on this a little bit or um, on, on you know, how many homes are there out for sale. And the question is, you know, the good news is it appears that um, inventory of existing homes is coming back to normal. We had a massive backlog. As we saw in Tom's chart, it seems to be stabilizing a lot closer to the norms. So that has really helped start to stabilize the market. We do have a little concern with this though, is that we see a more powerful shadow market issue emerging, potentially more po powerful than what people have discussed with the foreclosures and the cycle and stuff like that. What we're seeing in the consumer research is a shadow market that's very different. It's the pent up supply of aging homeowners who've been waiting for news that the market is improving. There's basically, depending on the market, a five to seven year backlog of people who otherwise would have sold their homes but didn't want to put it on the market because the market looked really bad. Now what we're seeing in our consumer research, now that the headlines are saying inventories are down, home prices are starting to climb again um, in our consumer research, we can bet there are gonna be a lot of homes put on sale, up for sale in the spring. And so it all depends whether the buyer's there or not as to what happens with that picture. Um, so the challenge is that supply increases aren't, only a portion of supply increases what builders put on the market. A larger portion of supply increase is what owners put on the resale market. And so in some markets, we're gonna see this dampen price growth. So while the fundamentals may continue, to, are likely to continue to improve, in some markets, we're gonna see such a rush of people putting their homes on the market that it's gonna wipe out any price gain in some of those markets. Um, now, what's gonna to continue to struggle? It's a little bit of a related issue here. So just pull a quick data point on that that we see is influencing some markets pretty significantly in some of the work with some of the clients we're doing. Let's take a look at the demand pool for existing trade-up homes. Um, the purple bar is the population in peak trade-up years. It tends to cluster around the age of 41, depending on the region of the country and depending on the year. Um, the orange bars are the people in the peak exit years. It tends to cluster roughly around age 61. And what we saw was that basically there was about, a, there, were about two, there was a two, twice large population hitting their peak trade-up years as there were people hitting their peak exit years. And so, you know, why is it the builders have been able to, had been able to capture 15% of the market in home sales? Well, it's because there was, you know, there was demand for additional homes than, you know, beyond what was being, being put on the market. As we noticed in 2010, that number has collapsed in part why builders have been having a tougher time putting more homes on the market, you know, because um, there's, you know, that gap has been closing. Here's the thing that really concerns us though, and it also depends on state by state, market by market. As we look at, these numbers are actually pretty predictable for 2020, because we know how many people, you know, in, you know, eight years from now, we know how many people are gonna be 40 to 44, and 60 to 64. Basically, we're at parity. Um, so while here, basically, if you had a trade up home, if you were at that peak exit year and you were exiting your trade up home to look for something smaller, there were twice as many people coming to the market as before. And that's why there were a lot of new homes built that 2x margin has been wiped out over there. So basically at that point, um, the supply and demand equation changes dramatically. And so this has had significant impact on thinking about who's gonna be buying homes, what are the markets gonna be for what type of product. Um, there's a big change in the works here that's gonna change dramatically what gets built and what gets absorbed. Now, we've talked about some of these bumps in the markets We'll, we'll just take some quick, quick highlights on, is a growth anywhere? And there are a couple things that we can say that we can be fairly positive about. Um, one of the things is that uh, you know, US population growth continues to march ahead. You know, you know, I was probably about the 190 millionth American born. You know, about every 20 years we add another 50 million. We're still on that track. Even though immigration is ground to an almost halt, we're still on that track to add population it probably explains why we're the, we're, you know, we're the only fully industrialized nation in the world. 
that's growing, most are completely flat. You do not want to be in the home building business in Europe or, or Eastern, in East Asia. I mean, you know, it probably explains why we're the only, you know, we're about the only country in America where there are kids who grew up saying they want to be a real estate developer. Um, you know, it's, it's a good thing we're here. Population growth, it, you know, it drives, you know, uh, you know, drives demand for housing. Now, but where is this shifting? Because the growth is really, really lumpy. One of the things we can project very easily is we take a look at the population 65 plus, about 40 million of them right now. By the end of this decade, which is not that far away, it's within the span of most of our careers, 36% um, increase. That's a very, very significant jump in population 65 plus. And that's going to change the dynamics of what gets bought and what gets sold. Um, as we take a look at it, you know, it was this generation as we look at young adult population. That 65 plus population were the baby boomers in the 70s where, you know, that drove massive growth in the young adult population. Then it stabilized and it actually flatlined for a while, which explains a lot of the issues we had in terms of where demand is for housing. We're now in the cycle where we've got this Generation Y population increasing once again. Um, and we're at that point where we're still, the increase is starting to moderate a little bit, but it's still increasing. So that's part of where the population, the, 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 the age structure of the population is changing. And that's going to change the dynamics of demand in America, just as the baby boomers had changed um, dynamics of demand through every life stage they entered through. Um, here's probably one of the more interesting uh, things that we've been working on lately. And that is when we take a look at um, population shifts, population dynamics with income dynamics. I'll take a little bit of time with this slide because there's, uh, it's a little bit complicated, but we took a look at the population of adults in their peak earnings years. And we tried to get a sense of how's this population shifting um, from the start of this decade to the end of this decade. And where it really got interesting is where we looked at this by race. So when we take a look at the, um, because basically the pop, in America has been fantastic at absorbing population growth and doing something very productive with it when they're in the peak earning years. It obviously spikes peak, you know, it correlates you know, very tightly with peak spending years. Um, and that's, we've, we've been on this remarkable cycle that's driven economic growth in America. But when we look at this decade, look at it by race, white, non-Hispanic, it's the first time in American history, I think, you know, at least Amer modern American history from when we have the data, but probably the first time in American history period, it's the first time where the white, non-Hispanic population of adults in the peak earnings years actually shrinks. That's a little bit of a problem. Um, now, the good news is it's more than made up by other um, ethnicities in here, but we start to, once again, see how these shifts are going to be a little bit lumpy and look a little different. Now, here's where it gets interesting is we map this out against income to take a look at what's the economic change and economic impact here. So when we match the population growth with um, or the population shifts with income dynamics, and let's just assume that each of them have the same income, because we've been essentially in an era of flat income over the past decade. Let's say we remain there, a same, same, assume same income, no one losing or gaining income. Here's what happens. Um, when we take a look at the, popula the, the population of the adult peak, uh, in peak earnings years, which also are the peak spending years, here's the problem. The white population, it's, at the end of this decade, it's $257 billion less income and essentially almost the same less spending generated. That's a huge, huge, huge hit to the economy. And actually this, this phenomena explains a lot why you know, Spain, Italy, and a lot of other countries we've been tracking have absolutely hit the wall. Um, now the good news once again is it's more than made up because we have, we've, we've been able to dynamically drive growth in America through different ways. So long term, we're really, we're still very bullish on the American economy. Short term though, it's lumpy. Um, so if that top line, if your audience looks like the top line, you know, whites in their peak earnings years and peak spending years, it's a declining market. But overall, we've got a growing market. And that's why I keep referring to this term lumpy. Growth is going to look very different than what we've seen before. So once again, to recap the, key three, uh, the three key themes, demographic trends driving decades of growth have disappeared. So when we talk about returning back to normal, you have to ask yourself, what is normal? And are, is look, looking forward, is that what we're going back to? Um, many of the profit pools driven by that, 
simply will not rebound. Actually, some are going to be shrinking. But the decade is ushering very different sets of profit pools. We spend a lot of time with our clients trying to figure out how to navigate and project which markets they've been relying on we know are going to shrink, which ones they can leverage, they can start to replace shrinking profits with uh, growth areas. That's part of the exercise that each of your organizations will probably have to start thinking about if you're looking to try to drive growth through the course of this decade. So, um, you know, the final thought I'm going to leave you with is, uh, you know, I think as uh, stated by uh, science fiction novelist uh, William Gibson, I think he described it as, uh, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. <laughs> All right, so those are my comments for now, and I think we'll have a fun discussion. Thanks. So all the presentations that you see will be posted on a website tomorrow. What? <laughs> we didn't tell you that? No, they'll be posted, and we'll give you the, uh, uh, the site that you should go to tomorrow, so you don't need to try to be furiously taking notes here. Uh, and also, James has said that he'll let the first five people download his iPod if, if they want to listen to his music. Uh, I'm going to ask only two questions, and I'm going so that we stay on schedule. Uh, I'm going to open up to questions from the audience. Uh, James, the questions mm -hmm. I have for you that you said that the profit pools will change. Yeah. So if you look at the housing industry, what would you see the areas of oper in this changing landscape that you described? Uh, is it multifamily construction that's going to boom, starter housing, luxury housing? I mean, can you get more specific about what the opportunity areas could be? Yes, with a caveat that it's obviously extremely regional as well, too. But a couple things that we like is that um, we like working with the clients who were betting on multifamily when things were really down um, and made the right moves to be releasing product at the right time. Um, multifamily is a fantastic place to be in some, some circumstances. I'm also very worried that the next bubble is multifamily uh, because you know, that's where the capital is pouring into right now. Um, and so. That's, uh, that's one of the things that we look at. We're absolutely fascinated by this dynamic of how people are going to live as America ages. Um, we've got some clients that we think are sitting in a really fantastic position because they've got, I think they've cracked the code on, um, on creating that place that people will move to. But what they've had to do very carefully is you know, we also spend a lot of time, you know, picking a part of the segments, you know, which of the prospects still have an equity stack in place to move. Um, so in other words, you know, we've got them targeting, um, you know, people who bought their homes in the 80s and 90s, not people who bought their homes yeah. in the 2000s because they have no equity stack remaining right now right. To, be able to, to be able to affect that move. So that's, you know, that, that's sort of like the, so um, yes, there are areas we're very optimistic about, but only, I mean, you really have to peel back a lot of the layers of the, uh, of, of the onion before you find, uh, you know, before you find the pool that will actually materialize versus the pool that you hope to materialize. Right. right. And Tom, uh, you have your forecast, reasonably optimistic. Uh, could you tell us what could, what are the forces that could make that forecast too pessimistic, and what forces could oh, cause it to be too pessim too yeah. optimistic? Well, well, I mean, from the standpoint of what, what, how it could be too optimistic. Um, you know, I, I could be, you know, I, I'm not expecting a strong U.S. Econ economic, you know, continued expansion, but a moderate one. There are a lot of things. We, you know, you talk about Europe, you talk about the election, you talk about fiscal cliff. I probably should have had an REM, end of the world as you know it, clip <laughs> for all the things that go on. But there are a lot of things going on, including on the political environment, and not just the election, but just on fiscal policy. That, that are, are really up in, up in the air. Um, there's also, we don't know what's going to happen to the mortgage finance industry. You know, everyone keeps saying, well, you know, what do we think about Fannie and Freddie and GSE? Well, we don't want them to go back to what they were. How are we going to change it? How are we going to get it? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Do you have a viable alternative for the fully private market? I don't even know what that means. Well, no, I, I don't know. The, the, the private label securities market was built to fail and almost the uh, free world as we now know it, and maybe we don't want to go back to that. Um, so the, the whole mortgage finance system is up in the air. So but there's the a lot of that. On the plus side? I think on the plus side, A, obviously, 
we, we could uh, get, you know, it's quite possible that the economic and expansion before accounting for housing could be stronger. It is quite conceivable that uh, if the jobs market expands at a faster pace, that that rebound in hedge, because remember, headship rates fell a lot, and household growth fell a lot. And one of the reasons that, not just that it fell, but it hasn't recovered much, as you mentioned, is, well, you know, there's low labor force participation because there ain't no jobs, or there aren't great jobs. If that comes back, yeah. you could, within two years from now, instead of getting, you know, maybe back to 750 single, or a one million total housing start, you, you, or, or household formations, which I'm assuming will get back to about 1.15 to 1, you could easily, with headship rates still being lower than 2010, you could get back to three years uh, from, say, 2013 to 16 of household formations of one and a half million. That would sop up whatever excess inventory is remaining awfully fast. And that could actually produce a much more optimistic scenario. I'd give them, I, I think they're equally weighted. I really do. I don't think, I don't think, you know, mine's, mine has gone from at the beginning of the year, it was considered overly optimistic. So it's now a wussy, it's almost become base case. Um, and and I, I do see the potential for significantly better. Okay. We're running a little behind, so I'm not going to take Sorry. too many questions from the audience, but two or three questions. Does anyone have a question? Yes. 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 $257 billion less income generated in 20, at the end of this decade. It didn't, it, it's not that people's incomes are declining. It's simply there are, it, it's a shrinkage of the population in the workforce. Just basic, you know, it, 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 it's, it's, it's no change in the economic state other than there are fewer of them. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it's not your job at stake there. Well, when you say three hundred five, I, I missed. Uh, what, about pretty much, you know, lower, lower down payment, the two to five percent down payment for a lot of these renters to get into the single family housing versus a twenty percent down, a five percent down. Isn't that, isn't that sort of the Fannie Mae or the National Housing Organization? Well, I, I, well, for Fannie Mae, there's, there's, there's two things. One, I don't, I don't see that they're, you know, right now. Fannie is still being driven by their conservator, and their conservator has taken the position that his job is to conserve capital. And I don't see Fannie Mae embarking, Fannie or Freddie embarking on what I would call, you know, lower down payment, an increase in lower down payment lending unless there were uh, other mitigating lower risk things. Second, of course, Fannie or Freddie cannot arbitrarily by charter do low down payment, meaning, um, um, uh, under 20% down payment unless there is private mortgage insurance or some other credit enhancement. And so that would not be a Fannie Freddie. That would be more, uh, maybe if FHA moved to something more aggressive. The problem with FHA, of course, is they are scared to death about having to have a bailout from Treasury. And so even though, you know, FHA has been talking about the settlement and this and that, they've actually done a little more in the way of tightening, uh, and quite frankly, I think a couple of things they've done have been a little too far. And that is where I think, you know, you would, if you were thinking of a focus on something that could help, especially the low and moderate income segment of the folks who have been hurt, some things like um, may, may, maybe instead of saying that someone who goes through a short sale can't get an FHA or a Fannie and Freddie loan for another three years, well, why don't we make it a year and a half? Okay, why don't we do that? I think that's where you'd see it. And there is a rumor that FHA is going to change that. I've heard that, but I can't confirm it. Okay, one more question. 
Okay. <laughs> Okay, a couple things on that in terms of... Could you hear that question? Yeah. No, can't, why Qu don't you... Question about whether ice share has forecast and starts and then where that might be. Um, there are a couple of mitigating factors that, we, that I would probably throw in the mix there. First off, I noticed that uh, your starts at the end of the projection period, which might have been 2015 or so, yes. uh, where you expect things to stabilize, was back the assumption that home builders are going to capture 15% of the 15% uh, of the of the sales, uh, which is which is typically where it's outside of the weird years of the last decade, which well. has been very stable. So it assumes it returns to normal. The question I flag is whether it will return to normal because there was a reason that home builders had to put 15, had to add 15% supply to the market because there were more people buying at that time. So the question is, um, will we return to that normal or not? If home builders think they're going to be building single family trade up homes that they've built so many of them in the past, that ain't going to happen. It simply flat out isn't going to happen. But there are other areas where there are going to be increases in demand that exceed supply that has existed in the past. And that is where there is population to sustain that growth. As we talked earlier, on the younger end, so maybe in some markets in the entry level home, in some markets it might be on the um, on the on the on the on the smaller home for an aging population, um, depending on the market. Um, so that's I think you know the 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 housing starts I think is going to be a little is maybe a little optimistic to assume a return to where normal used to be, but I still do anticipate that some developers some builders are absolutely going to find those pockets where it exists. Okay. So this will conclude the first session today. Uh, I know probably most of you, when you think of Hanley Wood, think about Hanley Wood's tied to housing, and that's where we came from. But at this point, our business is about 50% tied to housing and 50% tied to commercial construction. And I'm sure for many of you that there is some of your business is in housing, some of it's in commercial. So we're not going to shortchange you on the, for, on the commercial forecast. That will follow this. But Thank you, James. Thank, Thank you, Tom. Well.